So it is my honor to introduce for today's talk in the series, Africa the Way Forward, Professor Akinwumi Ogundira. The professor is a chancellor's professor and professor of Africana Studies, Anthropology and History at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also the editor-in-chief of the Africa Archaeological Review. He's going to tell us about his new publication and also make some comments about Africa the way forward. So, Professor, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Iniguali. It's a pleasure to join you on this program. Well, uh, we are talking, let me start with the book, uh, which is just uh, out in the, in the market about the Yoruba people. For, for many listeners, uh, the Yoruba constitutes one of the largest cultural groups in Africa. It is also one of the most influential in the Americas uh, due to the Atlantic slave trade. The scholarship on the Yoruba is very extensive, in part because of the fecundity of their cultural production in arts, political, political organization, economic system. Yet, the historical framework that we have been using to study and teach about the Yoruba, about their culture, is based on the late 19th century model that Samuel Johnson created in his book, History of the Yorubas, published in 1921. In the course of doing my research, I began to realize that many of the stories and narratives that have become canonical in Yoruba historiography do not fit the existing framework that many scholars uh, have been using. And I'm talking about my work in the, in the late 1990s all the way through 2010. Instead, so I realized that what many of my of, of, of pioneer scholars in Yoruba studies have been doing is when they come across something that is new, they try to fit it within the existing framework instead of using their data to challenge the historical framework. Of course, I know this, this takes some kind of courage to challenge the existing framework. So that's why uh, uh, writing this book has been, uh, I would say an obsession of mine for the past 10 to 15 years. And in writing the book, let me pay homage to three individuals who, have, who influenced my career. I will start with Ade Obayemi. Ade Obayemi, the late Ade Obayemi, he indeed in the 70s, 80s, 90s, he challenged us to think differently, but some scholars did not listen to him. Then I, I happen to be uh, someone that was close to him as well. Then my mentors in undergraduate years at IFE, uh, Omoto Shoiluyemi, they told me about, about the need to be very much interdisciplinary in the way we approach African early history, now, oral traditions, uh, archaeology, uh, folklore, and many other things. Then, but personally, Agbaje Williams said that it is not enough to think about new methods to study African history we also have to be theoretical, that merely focusing on methods means that we are borrowing methods from Europe to explain our experience. So I again, I began to think about the importance of methods, the importance of theories, theories that derive from the subjects that I'm studying. So in writing this book, therefore, uh, I, I, I tapped into my transdisciplinary training in archaeology, in anthropology, in history, and I use this to, 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 to refine our understanding of Yoruba history. 
the book addresses three things. The first, I ask the question, what is the Yoruba experience of time? Time is critical if you're gonna study by issue, right? What events did they respond to? How did these events transform their experiences and their culture? So I tried to account in this book for about 2000 years of Yoruba history from about 300 BC all the way through 1840, 1840. Also, I realized that we cannot study Yoruba history without understanding their own theories of existence, without looking at the ideas that shaped how they managed the experiences of time. What kinds of visions, what kinds of inspirations motivated the, the actions of the ancestors whom I'm studying? How did they solve problems? So, the question of epistemology therefore becomes very important. What are the theories of knowledge in Yoruba society? What are their ontologies? What are their ways of being, right? And what is, what is their axiology? That is, what are the values that shaped their experience? Most of the time, when we talk about African history, we talk about trade, migrations, political development, but we don't really pause and say, okay, what kinds of ideas, what kind of theories do these people have? How do they solve problems, okay? So the third component of my, so the, the second component therefore focuses on conceptual issues. The third dimension, look at the major staples of, of, of historiography. You know, when we talk about history of the people, we have to talk about their migrations. I'm talking about migrations, divergences, the combination, looking at regional dimension of their history, the subcontinental dimension of Yoruba history. We don't do that enough, right, in African historiography, that the Yoruba were not just this isolated tribe operating among themselves. I wanted to understand what was the impact of Ghana Empire, what was the relationship between Mali Empire with the Yoruba, the impact of climate change, the role of gender, relations among the Yoruba, how did that shape their issue? So these are the kinds of issues that are addressed in the book. So first and foremost, for the first time, we have a very tightly defined chronological framework for studying Yoruba issues, something that tends to be missing when we talk about pre-colonial. We always talk about pre-colonial as if pre-colonial is just one horizon of time. In this case, I defined seven periods for Yoruba history, right? Uh, from the archaic period to the, to the early formative or to the late formative, and I explain what was happening in each period of time to the classical period, stretching from the 11th century all the way to the end of the 14th century, looking at the Atlant uh, what I call the intermediate period, the period between the classical and the arrival of the Europeans on the coast, Looking then, I focus on the impacts of, of European pressure, that is the, the, the Atlantic trade, the Atlantic slavery, looking at the impact on the Yoruba culture as well. So these are the issues that I address in the book. And, and this allows me to, to really drill down into events and people and ideas that shaped Yoruba history. From their origins in the niger Bedouin Conference, uh, about 300 BC, uh, where there was just a very small group of people. And how did they become the largest cultural group south of River Niger over the next 1,000 years, right? How did Yoruba languages diverge into what we have today, into different dialects? So these are the kinds of issues that I address in the book. Wow, that's a good appetizer. <laughs> <laughs> you have seven uh, periods. Can yes. you tell us something about the, the earliest period? Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the earliest period is what, we, what I call the archaic period. And that is when, uh, that is between 300 BC and 300 AD. Something important happened in, during those 600 years that shaped the history of the Yoruba forever. 
And that was a period that we call the big dry period. It was an extreme climate, I mean, change in climate. It was very dry. It was that same period that the Yoruba began to migrate, to begin to move out of their South uh, Niger Benue confluence area, it began to spread. So over the next 600 years, what happened is we have three branches of culture that developed from what I call the proto Yoruboid. The first is the proto Yoruba. The second is the proto Igala on, on the other side of the Niger. And the third is proto Ishekuri. So the Yoruba ancestors who lived around the Vanaja Benue Conference, they were, we historians call them uh, proto Yoruboid. They give back to three branches of cultures today. And then the proto Yoruba began to move all through the Ekiti landscape, what is now Ekiti, the northern, uh, north central Yoruba. They began to split into different dialects. So today we have more than 30 Yoruba dialects. I was able to trace the, the movement of these people and, and the branching off of these dialects over the next 1,000 years. Then we come to uh, what I call the uh, 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 um, early formative period, right? And early formative period began about 250 AD all the way to about 500, 600 AD. And that's when you begin to see development of uh, political systems that, that, that laid the foundation for Yoruba political institutions in the seventh century AD. That is the beginning of the um, uh, late, uh, late formative period. That's when you begin to see a modicum of uh, uh, the divine kingship institution, not fully developed yet, but those ideas are beginning to evolve. The, the, the idea of, of, of centralized political organization. So by, by uh, between 800 and 900 AD, we know that there are at least three centers of these political innovations in Yoruba land. Uh, one in the Kiti area, another one in present day Ijebu area, Another one in what is there called Owo area in the in the in the uh, Yoruba eastern part. So, and then by the beginning of the 11th century, uh, the, uh, the, the last wave of centralized king kingdoms developed, and Ileife is one of them. So, and Ileife will become the champion of centralized political government uh, governance, which also privileges. The, the urban model of settlement, the, the, this, this idea of organizing people in cities and towns, this is another part of Yoruba sociology. You can understand Yoruba sociology without their kingship institution, as well as their uh, uh, urbanism. These are two important ingredients of what constitute the Yoruba. So in my book, I argue that it was actually around the 11th to 12th century that the a pan regional identity of the Yoruba began to develop. And, and, and Ileife played a very central role in that. Ileife was not the original center for divine kingship institution, but it ended up becoming the, the most, the strongest advocate of that model of governance. And this is what, what happened. Divine kingship, which many scholars always write about, people don't really understand what it means. What it means is an individual, the king, is claiming to have divine authority while he is still alive. Before that period, that is in the early formative and uh, late formative, the, 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 the religions or philosophical uh, worldview was that an individual cannot be a god when he's still alive. You have to die, physically die. But when you die, your aspiration in life was to become an ancestor, that is, to become a deity after death. So that is, you could, so, so uh, but physical death is different from, 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 from uh, uh, you, can, you can die physically, 
but in as much as your spirit lives on, you have conquered death. That is because you become a God and your, your, your descendants continue to worship you. They will have a shrine for you. They will have a temple for you. That was the model of governance that many of the leaders, they were not divine. They only attained divinity after death. But when divine kingship began, the kings were not claiming that they are divine when they are still alive. That is, they've conquered death when they're still alive. <laughs> it was a revolutionary, it was a revolutionary idea. And many people kicked against it. But they prevailed. These, these new men who are claiming to be divine while I stay alive, who now we call them divine king. See, the word that we use for king in Yoruba Oba does not mean divine king. There are many kingdoms, I mean, there are many societies among the Yoruba that had that title uh, in, the, in, in, in this, uh, in, in this uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth century. So, but when now we, we now have a, a system of governance where that is that are this around the divine king, that will now become, become associated only with divine kings. So what separated divine king from other people is that a divine king attains immortality while he is still alive. Whereas in the previous centuries, that is what you achieve after you, you are dead and then physically dead, and then you are resurrected. And then you have monuments, you have sculptures, created to continue to for your for your redefication. So this is so Ilefe became a very strong advocate of this new system of governance. Ilefe also reorganized all the panty, all the Odisha, all the all the deities that were already existing in the region, reorganized them, systematized them, and turned turn itself, that is Ilefe, turned itself as the cradle of all of these ideas. Of, about, about divine kingship, about, about uh, different pantheon. The third thing that Ilefe did was, see, when you have an idea like divine kingship, you, you must have the material to concretize it. You must have emblems, symbols, paraphernalia for it. Until 11th century AD, the Yoruba always relied on, on, on importing or purchasing beaded necklace that would distinguish their, their elevated men and women from others who are not so elevated. So they, so they relied on, on, on other societies, not up north the, the Vanager, to, to acquire those beads. We call them Akun in Yoruba language, but these are Kasedni beads. Now, what Ilefe did was, Ilefe began to manufacture his own beads from glass. It is the only place we know of today uh, in Africa, south of uh, the south of the uh, Nile, where glass was produced. So Ilefe began to use its own local products to legitimize political institutions instead of relying on the outside force. First and foremost, Ilefe was able to produce more glass beads and faster and cheaper than the imported ones. And this also increased, or in fact, this proliferated divine kingship institution across the Yoruba land between 11 and 14th century AD, because now you have the, 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 the instruments for legitimizing that, that institution was readily available from Ilefe. So Ilefe used this technological innovation to recenter itself as the, as, as, as the source of Yoruba divine kingship, as a source of social order. So the idea of, since kingship is the basis of social order, since urbanism is the basis of Yoruba social order, since the Orisha is the basis of <laughs> Yoruba social order, Ilefe now produce the instrument that will legitimize all of these three things. And uh, Ilefe became the center of the Yoruba world as a result of that. So the position of Ilefe in Yoruba uh, sociology was, was a constructed one. It was not something that just happened. It was, it was the product of innovations that individuals had. It was, it was part of the vision of, of some men and women who created that identity for Ilefe. 
So that was the foundation of what we call pan Yoruba identity, which today is, is, is so contrary to what many scholars would say that, oh, the Yoruba became conscious of themselves in the 19th century. I argue in my book that no, this has been going on since about 11th century AD. And that what happened in the 19th century was just a continuity of the vision of some men and women who studied this by 1,000 years before. So, and then uh, uh, when we don't get to about, about, about 1380, we begin to see another dimension of ecological stress. So that is another period of uh, uh, what, what we call little ice age in Europe, translated in Africa to uh, uh, drought, extreme drought. Uh, we started about 1380 and lasting in fact till about 17th century. So that period also created a lot of uh, uh, uprising among the Yoruba. Also, Mali Empire was also crashing around that time. Mali Empire was a major trading partner of Ilefe, okay? So uh, the decline of Mali Empire uh, also caused economic trouble for the Yoruba as well because they couldn't sell their products out, you know, again. So that created some, some, some for, for about 150 years, uh, there, were, there, was, there was instability in Yoruba land. And then, but then, um, starting from about 1570, we begin to see the rejuvenation of the Yoruba political system again, now led by Oyo, what became Oyo Empire. So, so I talk about all these transformations, but it was at that same period that the Atlantic trade began, uh, began uh, to, 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 to coalesce along the, along the coast. So I talk about the impact of, of this Atlantic uh, trade, which turned later into Atlantic slave trade, uh, the impact on Yoruba culture, the impacts on Yoruba economics, and the impact on Yoruba political system. So, and that's how the, the book continues all the way through 1840, looking at the impact of that on the Yoruba society in the 19th century. Can I ask uh, a question about the archaic? But let me put it this way. What do you think of the view by Reich, and that is uh, David Reich, in his work, um, who makes the statement that the Yoruba descended from two highly differentiated African populations mm -hmm. in equal proportion. Mm -hmm. He makes this claim or this uh, proposition in uh, chapter nine of his work. What do you think of that statement? Okay. Do you well, agree from what you've seen? Well, I'm assuming that he made that statement based on genetic evidence. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, Genetic studies is still an evolving uh, uh, method, especially for studying African past. And uh, I'm always very cautious about how I use it or how I interpret it because there are so many gaps in it. However, I can, I can, I mean, my work uh, will indicate a lot of mixture of African populations. I may not be very comfortable in saying there are two equal branches that the Yoruba came from. As I said in my, in my opening remarks, the Yoruba as a language community, it's not gonna be the same as the Yoruba as a genetic community. They are two different things. People get into a culture, language is culture and people, anyone can speak a language. So what we know is that the language the ancestral language that gave birth to modern Yoruba developed about 2500 BC, about the same time that the ancient Egyptians were consolidating old kingdom. Many languages were evolving south of River Niger, especially within the Niger Congo language family. And Yoruba, Yigbo, uh, Edo, Nope were among those languages that evolved between actually 3000 BC and about 2500 BC. So that we know that the, the, the proto Yoruba language was limited to 
the area of the Niger Benue Conference for about 2000 years. Now, around 300 BC, they began to move. I mean, different branches of that community began to move out and migrate southward. They, in the new area they were moving into, there were hunter gatherers living, the late Stone Age people living in those areas, right? So the Yoruba, my, the, the proto Yoruba who are migrating out of the ancestral homeland will have been meeting those later Stone Age people and make, you know, genetically mixing with them. So maybe that is another branch of the of the of the genetic component that constitute the Yoruba today, I would say yes. I would say that there are many there are many genetic components that made up the Yoruba. It's not because being Yoruba is not a genetic identity. It is a cultural identity. Over the last five hundred years alone, we know many Nope people who became Yoruba. We know many Bariba who became Yoruba. We know Ausa, who became Yoruba. You see, so, and vice versa, there were, there were Yoruba speaking people who migrated and became something else in another place. So African history really is a history of people moving around and interbreeding with one another. These are, these are not people who are caged in particular geography. No, they, they created networks. Yeah, uh, uh, Western intellectual framework in, of the 19th century wanted to create racial groups. So when, when Europeans arrived, they were preoccupied with classifying us into racial or tribal groups. These are the Yoruba, this is what they do. These are the, these are the Hausa, this is what they do. These are the Igbo, this is what they say. Those Africans, rejected those categories in their history. Their history does, is not consistent with this very rigid geography or, or this, this, uh, this, this tribalization of our history. We are people who created networks of trade, 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles. People were trading with one another, intermarrying with one another. So I, I, I can see that the Yoruba elements of today, they are products of many genetic mixings. Uh, I will not say there's only two branches. I will say there are many branches, but maybe we can classify them into just two. But I think if we drill, if we drill down, we will see that there are many, many elements that constitute that. So, but genetic studies is not part of my of this work because it is so tentative. I did not want to include what is still evolving in this book because I already have so much to talk about. So, so I think that would be my informed. Uh, comments on David Wright's uh, 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 interpretation, genetic interpretation of Yoruba history. So I can say that for sure that there were mixing of Yoruba agriculturalists who are migrating uh, are between 300 BC and 300 AD with later Stone Age communities that were occupying other areas they were moving into. The African humid period, the African humid period uh, lasted from about 7,000 BC mm -hmm. to uh, about 4,000 BC. That is, the, that, that is when many of the cultures we refer to today in Africa, the Mande, the Yugo, the Congo, they, they began to develop around that time. So ancient Egypt developed after that as a result of the end of that African humid period around around 300, I mean, around 3000 BC, the, which led to the desertification of the Sahara, right? Created again, another major up, uh, up upheaval that, that led to people to begin to migrate out of what is now Sahara. So it is around that period that many cultures in Africa actually uh, uh, began to take their distinct identity. Uh, so, uh, 20,000 years ago, you're looking at hunter gatherers in Africa speaking different languages. Few of those languages existed today, and that would be the, the clique uh, languages of uh, the Sun, 
these are, yes, we can see them as the aboriginal Africans, aboriginal human beings, right? So the son, the Hadza of Tanzania, the son of uh, Southern Africa, the Khoi Khoi, but other, other hunter-gatherers community, they were eventually, many of their languages were, were absorbed or they were absorbed into the farmers who are migrating from what is now Mali area, Niger Congo people migrating and spreading out, which is, so that's why Niger Congo language families spread across West and Central and Southern Africa, all the way to East Africa. So this is a product of, of what happened between uh, I would say 7,000 BC and 5,000 BC. <laughs> I wonder if he, he probably was thinking about the real, real long haul. I mean, the evidence we have, and I think he suggests this, and I see, I've seen other scholars talking about it, yeah. is that humans emerge around 300, at least Homo sapiens, yes. right? Yes. Would go back to about 300,000 years ago. I yes. mean, I've even seen 400,000 years ago mentioned. Yeah. And all right, so uh, let us assume that happened and it's recognized that Africa would be the cradle, mm -hmm. the place from which, or the, not just the cradle, but the, it's the, the cradle. stage, yeah. <laughs> right? It's the cradle. It's the stage for, <laughs> For, for the whole activity. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed that Wright also points out that from what I gather in his work, West Africa would have a very important role in terms of this early place of origin. Now, we always used to put it at East Africa exclusively, mm. right? Yeah. But what I, well, again, the book is controversial mm -hmm. um, because he's suggesting that these are two differentiated populations would also have impact on the modern humans of today. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. So I'm beginning to see now uh, uh, the, you know, the root um, taken on a lot of complexities. I think the, the, the problem that the, we have many geneticists who are interested in historical issues, but they, they are not trained in how in, Afri historical, in African history. Yes. And they think they can write African history just in the lab with their genetic yeah. study. They are not, they are not, they are not. <laughs> I, like, I like that. <laughs> no, I mean, you see, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree that there were many, in fact, there were so many different populations 20,000 years ago, all the way through uh, till about uh, 2,000 years ago in West Africa, you know, hunter gatherers living in their own different enclaves. But as you very well know, the people that tend to procreate faster, I mean, fast, fast, they are farmers, right? <laughs> Because farmers procreate and they have their population increase faster than than hunter gatherers, so the beginning of agriculture, therefore, uh, which which did not pre predate the beginning of African humid period, which was the you know the end of uh, ice age, you know, we're, we're talking about ten thousand BC onward, that period laid the foundation of agriculture in Africa, one of the earliest in the world, right? And, 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 and the beginning of that meant that African, those, those farmers were able to increase their population, migrate into other areas, you know, because they needed farmland, right? Where they encounter hunter gatherers, intermarry with them, mix with them, so that African genetic components, therefore, is going to represent a very, a very diverse uh, genetic components because you have people moving from one area over 500 years, they, 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 they intermarry with another group, they introduce their own way of life to those people. So you, you, so you see a lot of uh, intermixing. So I'm not going to throw away the fact that they were, yeah. they were mixing, but what, what I would be cautious about is that 
there was no Yoruba 20,000 years ago. <laughs> because the language, if language is the primary means we have to define the people, that language only began to evolve about 2,500 BC, okay? And um, but in the in the process of their of their expansion to other areas, they encounter different elements, different genetic pools, which became part of the people who speak the language. Anyone can speak a language. I don't have to have uh, French genes to speak French. <laughs> I don't have to have Chinese genes to speak Chinese. <laughs> so so and uh, we have to look at a, a culture like from that point of view as well. Okay, so you date um, the language to about 2,500? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, that, that brings me to another question. Um, I have um, come across work which suggests that some Yoruba words and linguistic uh, structure generally mm -hmm. would um, have correlations with ancient Egyptian uh, language systems. Yes. What do you think, have you seen any evidence for that in your work? Well, um, I'm, I'm not a historical linguist. I, I do borrow from historical linguists and I collaborated in my work with uh, Christopher Eric, uh, UCLA in, in, in assisting me with, my, with the genetic, uh, with the language data. So I'm not, I'm not an historical linguist, I understand how it works, but I don't do that research. However, I am familiar with, uh, with, with studies that use, that identify Yoruba words and see their commonality, uh, whether phonetics uh, with uh, Asian Egyptian, I mean, uh, language. Um, we, we still have a long way to go to be able to explain the those similarities and what they mean. For example, we talk about ancient Egypt, but really ancient Egypt evolved in what is now Nubia, right? I mean, South Egypt, Nubia, Kama civilization. That, that is the origin of the ancient Egyptian. Before we begin to understand the relationship between ancient Egyptian language and Yoruba, we need to understand the relationship between Nubia and Yoruba and other groups. Unfortunately, that language is dead. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't know it. We don't understand what is spoke. However, with more efforts, maybe we'll come across that Asian language. Maybe with material culture, we'll be able to understand the relationship between Nubia and other parts of Africa, south of River Nile. So we, we have gaps. So what, what some of us are doing is we are moving from the known to the unknown. So uh, the known is what can we understand in the last 2000 years? So even my work doesn't go to 2500 BC because I don't have data for that, but I have linguistic data. I have archeological data stretching from about 300 BC up to the present. So now that this work is done, I hope a new generation of scholars was okay, let us take it back from 300 BC and look at what happened all the way through 2500 BC. And from there, uh, we can then trace things back to Nubia, the Nile Valley and see the interactions. So there are still many gaps that uh, we, uh, we, I'm an empiric, I'm an empirical historian, <laughs> as an archeologist, I look for data for something and I try to explain what I'm seeing in the context of my theory, in the context of my questions. So um, I recognize the validity of what scholars are doing in comparative linguistics uh, or compar uh, comparative language, but there are, there, are, there are gaps there about how, what, what, what accounts for these similarities. We have to, those have to be explained. We cannot assume them. Well, I'm hoping that uh get one of these um, historical linguists to come on the, <laughs> on the program yeah, uh, in yeah. due course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, see how this information, uh, how, how it's formulated. Mm -hmm. But by the way, I wanted to ask you about Ifa. 
How does Ifa fit into the whole scheme of things? Divination, Ifa divination, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Ifa divination is an I in my book I I, I explain that. It's a, it's a system of knowledge that the proto Yoruba were already developing uh, around 300, before 300 BC. There was already divination going on among these, the late Stone Age and early Iron Age people. So if I was part of the uh, cultural repertoire that they, they took with them when the, the great migration you know, started around 300 BC, and you will see that among the Igala, among the Idoma, I think people around river, around the Niger Beno conference, there are many people who are already practicing Ifa, or I mean some modicum of Ifa. And it was in a Kiti area that the system began to take a very full shape, uh, you know, you know uh, between 500 AD and uh, 1000 AD. And again, nothing was, nothing, nothing was static. It was in Ilefe that Ifa was codified. The codification of Ifa as a system of, of divination, Ilefe contributed to that, to that, but it was not the original place of Ifa. It was already existing as a way of knowing, as a way of making inquiry. It's an intellectual system. It requires a lot of many years of training. It's uh, it's it, it is not it is not it's a divination, but it's it's not it's not just something that an individual can receive, you know, from from the power beyond. You know, it's something that is studied the same way that you and I went to the university and and, and learn how, how to understand the world through books. That is what Ifa is. Ifa is not something that you possess because you are born into it. It is, it is something that you study, right? So it's a system of knowledge that is a, a very unique African system of knowledge, a very unique Yoruba system of knowledge. And that's why the Yoruba will say that the beginning and the end of Yoruba history and culture is Ifa. The same way that the Christian will say the beginning and the end of history is the Bible, <laughs> right? Or, or Quran for the Muslims. So Ifa is, the, is what you would consult when you are unsure or when you do not know. It's what you consult to know. So Ifa plays a very big role in the, in the, in the development of Yoruba cultural institution. It, but it is, it, is a, it is a very old system that evolved and changed over time. And I explained that in chapter three of my book about, about the transformations that happened and how different branches of Ifa existed and in Ilefe, it was codified into one, into one. Oh, good. I look forward to looking at that from <laughs> and the whole book. And yeah. I actually wanted to ask you um, whether you can um, explain the illustration that you have. And I noticed that you have it um, also Yes, I I collect African art. Well, let me put it this way: I collect Yoruba art more than other any other art. So I collected the cover, what I use as cover, which is also uh, a painting that uh, I have behind me. Uh, a friend of mine, who is an artist in Nigeria, I've known him for many years, uh, Moses Ogunle. I collect his work a lot. Now he's famous. I cannot. I don't think I can afford him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he painted this in 2011 in Nigeria, in Ibadan, and I was visiting his studio. He just, he was still posting finishing touches onto it, and I said, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to get this. And he looked at me, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm going to get it. So, anyway, we negotiated, I got it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, when I got it, I knew that I'm going to use it as the cover of my book. This is 2011. This is about nine years ago. I knew, so I mean, I've been, I've been writing this book in my head for many years. So I knew that this is the book, and I like it because it is a, it is a masquerade. The, the, the masquerade, uh, and then it, which is an ancestral masquerade, a very important part of Yoruba cultural activities. You know, every year we have uh, ancestral festival. 
And that's when the mass prayer will come out. That is, the ancestors will return to the world to, re, to, uh, to renegotiate with human beings, to, 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 to renegotiate with their descendants, to have communion. So between the, the ancestors and the living. And in the, at the back of the, of the masculine are the spectators. Now, one can interpret it as also as the descendants who are still around to receive the egungun. Egungun is the word for masculine in Yoruba. So to receive the ancestor who is visiting. Since this book is about the ancestors, it's not about, it's not about the present really, it's about the ancestors. So I find this painting befitting as the cover for the book because the ancestor is right there in front of us. And then you open the page, I'm talking about them. So, that's, so that is the story of this painting, why I acquire it and why it's the cover of the book. <laughs> and let me tell you that I really love the, you know, the your background, it's so beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so one last question that um, I would like to, to throw out. And it's about, um, I think I saw some references in your text, the Essie it's, figurines. It's, it's yeah. Essie figurines. Yeah. figurines in yeah. Quara State. In Quara State, yes. Yes. What are, what are they all about? Oh, yeah. Essie figurines are one of those iconic Artist, uh, uh, cultural sites in Yoruba land. You know, Isie is a, the name of a town uh, in present day Kwara state, which is more of a north, north central Yoruba cultural region. Uh, for many years, uh, we see the Isie figures as enigmatic because they are not, they are naturalistic, but they are, they are, they are uh, minimalist uh, formalism. That's the term that uh, art historians use to describe it. It's not as evolved as the Ife, natural, uh, Ife naturalism. Nevertheless, it is naturalism as well. But what I see in my work is that its here figures are very similar to the stone sculptures that you see in Ife and in the Kiti region before the classical period. So this, this idea of representing men and women in, 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 in stone figures to capture their essence is something that goes back to at least 700 AD because the Sierra figures have been dated, their context have been dated to about 700 AD. So Ade Obayami mentioned, now let me go back. Uh, Isia figures, there are about 1,000 figures that we call it Sia figures. Uh, they were found back in the 1930s. And over time, there have been many studies on them. There are PhD dissertations written on them from, by, by archeologists, art historians, anthropologists, and many other people. So, so but they still remain an enigma. Adi Obayemi, way back in the 1970s or 80s, said that there was a kingdom around that area called Oba Kingdom and that the Isia figures will be part of that kingdom. So in my book, I made the case that Isia figures were ways of celebrating the ancestors. They were, it, it was a communal, it was a, a collective that society, the community came together and, 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 and always had it. These were not done at one time they will have taken place over several generations as a way of celebrating their ancestors so that the ancestors were celebrated in communally, not what happened during the classical period. That's when you begin to see figures being created as shrines in individual homes. In the case of the ACA, the community celebrated their ancestors together in one place. And that is how these ACA figures came about. Now, there were debates in the past about whether they were local to that area, whether the, the sculptures, you know, produced them locally. Now, 
geological, geochemical research has proven without any doubt that these figures were done right there. The, the, the images, I mean, the stones they used to carve these images, we find these stones. We have the incomplete ones. My colleague, um, uh, Ari Bidesi Usman, has done extensive work on this as well. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, Kola Dekola, another young archaeologist, does finish his PhD on this. So we know that these sculptures were done in situ around the area, and that the and that the sculptors sourced their raw materials from the statite stones that are very abundant in this area. These are very soft stone. So the sea figures, therefore, uh, they are part of the cultural milieu of the Yoruba, going back to about 700 uh, AD. So so these figures were associated with one of the first kingdoms in Yoruba land, even before Ilefe evolved. Now, uh, again, my mind went down to a knock, <laughs> right? Yeah. The knock terracotta, you know, how, do you see any kind of, I mean, the time frame is, is quite different. Very different. But, and, um, yeah. Any comments? Yes, I do. I do. See, the knock, uh, civilization came to an end around 200 AD. Now, my the same event that led to the collapse of the Nok, which was the big dry period, 300 BC to 200 to 300 AD, the same event that led to the crash of the Nok stimulated the development of the Yoruba. Okay, so. It was that the same event that 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 made the Yoruba to begin to migrate out of the original homeland. It is also the same event that led to the the, the crash of the Nok. So, uh, it is not impossible that the Yoruba, the the proto Yoruba people, who are familiar with Nok people because they live only about hundred kilometers north of them. It is not impossible that they were aware of them, uh, but the methods, the, 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 the technique, and even the forms are totally different. The knock culture was more stylistic, was, 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 was not natural. The goal of the artist was not to reach naturalism. Whereas in the Yoruba side, you begin to see attempts to get at naturalism. Even if it was still very minimal in the in the seventh century, they were they were going towards naturalism. So that that is the main difference between Nock and Yoruba. And then Nock was mostly terracotta. Isie was mostly stone figures. They they did some terracotta as well, but it was mostly uh, uh, stone figures. So the medium of art in in Nock and Isie totally different. Is the way forward. The way forward in Africa in general, uh, not just the Nigeria or Yoruba, is I think we are going through a crisis. Africans are going through a crisis of identity in their own continent. And Black people globally are also going through a crisis of identity. And the crisis is we have allowed somehow. <laughs> And I know, I know the impact of colonialism, but we are not the only people who are colonized, right? Africans are not the only ones. Black people are not the only ones colonized. But somehow, somehow we let it get into us more than other people. And what I mean by that is we have leaders who are apologetic about their culture and about their existence as human beings. In as much as that apology continues, Africa will not find a way forward. The way forward for Africa is to understand the righteousness of their existence as human beings, to understand the righteousness of their culture, to understand the righteousness of their history. This is the foundation of what builds a community, a community that is conscious it, uh, to be a conscious community means that you understand your past, you understand where you're coming from, you celebrate it, not because it is perfect, but, but because it is part of you. 
And that part of you would then allow you not to accept anything that's everything that is dumped on you. See, so I think the way forward uh, is, is, is for African leadership, African elite uh, to, to, uh, to uh, accept the righteousness of their existence, their cultural, historical existence. Now we're talking about glass beads. Now I was talking about Ilefe, manufacturing glass. Glass manufacturing is one of the most complicated technologies in the world. Any society that, 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 that made glass in the Asian world is regarded as sophisticated, okay? And in, in Ilefe, they achieved that. They looked inward to create prosperity. Ilefe therefore became the emporium of West Africa for about 400 years. See, it's, 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 it's the Wakanda of Africa, <laughs> okay? We talk about Wakanda. So Wakanda, Black, Black Panther may be a futuristic, but we need to understand that in the past, some African society achieved the same thing. They used technology. A glass bead was more than wearing beads. There are some spiritual powers, spirituality that comes from the elements of nature that they use to make glass. Those elements were healing elements that people wear. So, so when you see blue, blue glass beads, you see red glass beads, you see yellow, these have healing properties, spiritual properties. So there's an understanding of their environment that made them to make those kind of glass beads. And, and, and this led the economic uh, 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 prosperity for the Yoruba world. So these, these kind of stories should be told to our young people so that they do not see the, uh, the Western world as the only source of solution to contemporary problems. Africans also can be part of the solutions to, to their own problems and to solve other problems in the world. So the way forward really as an historian, as, an, as, as a cultural scholar, I cannot think of human development outside cultural values, how, what we value and how we value it. So when we value our culture, we begin to value ourselves and we begin to respect ourselves as well. Otherwise, there won't be any respect for us if we cannot value and respect what we have. I, you, you have just given me a quotable quote <laughs> that Africans <laughs> must recognize the righteousness of their existence. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> it has been a great pleasure to add an honor to host this discussion. And I shall be doing a lot of reading <laughs> in the next few days. And <laughs> Thank you for having me.